Detective, would you knock on the door and let the bailiff know we're ready? Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Martinez. The state recalls uh, Detective Esteban Flores to the stand. Detective Flores, you are still under oath. Do you understand? Yes, I do. Your name, sir? Esteban Flores. Yes, she did. And in it, uh, as a return or in the message, did she include the number for you to call her back on? Yes. Let's take a look at Exhibit 389. Yes. I is that that message including her voice and the telephone number that she left for you? Yes, it is. Move for the admission of this to my cell phone on June 21st, 2008 uh, from Jody Arias. Documents in Exhibit 366. The number that is, telephone number that is referenced there, is that the same one as the one referenced by Miss Arias in her call? Yes, it is. I don't have any other questions. Cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Mm. Detective, you were present when the photos of uh, Miss Arias and Mr. Alexander were shown in court, correct? Yes. Okay. And those were recovered from the camera on the scene, right? Yes. Okay. And that was a few weeks after uh, the investigation began that those photographs were actually recovered, right? That's correct. It took a couple weeks for your forensics department to, to obtain those? Yes. Okay. 
in before they obtained those, had you had any other evidence that Miss Arias was at Mr. Alexander's home on June 4th? No, I don't believe so. Okay. So you, you spoke with numerous friends of his, right? Yes. Okay. You and your other investigators, people at the scene, that sort of thing. Numerous people at the scene, friends of his, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and the roommates, and none of them gave you any information, the idea that Miss Arias was coming to visit Mr. Alexander, right? That's correct. Okay. Sounds to me like it's a secret, right? The statute calls for speculation. Sustained. <clears throat> Nothing further. Redirect. No, thank you. Any questions from the jury for this witness? I see no hands. You may step down. You may call your next witness. The state calls the custodian of records for spread. Jeff Strom, J E F F S T R O H M, the mayor. All right, raise your right hand. If you do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Please walk right around and have a seat. Your name, sir? My name is Jeff Strom. And uh, who do you work for? I work for Sprint Nextel Telecommunications. And what, what kind of business is that, just briefly? We're a cell phone company. And I'm going to show you exhibit number 366. Does your company keep records that are made at or near the time that the telephone call is being made? Yes. And the information that's on these records, is it created from the information transmitted by the handsets as they're communicating through your network? Yes, they are. And these numbers or these, this information, is that kept in the normal course of business? Yes. And with regard to the item that you have in front of you, are there those partial records for a telephone number? Yes, they are. And what's that telephone number? The phone number is 831 402 one nine zero one. And those are true and accurate copies of the originals that you have on file. Yes. I'm going for the admission of exhibit number three C six. Three sixty six is admitted. Just so that we can get familiar with uh, how they look. Take a look at the uh, second page. In the first column, when it says calling NBR, what are we talking about? That's the calling number. That's the number that's initiating a particular phone call. So for example, if we take the first one, that the initiating number is an 801 number, right? Yes. And the number that they called is our target phone, correct? Not necessarily, no. Okay. Why do we have there 11831402 uh, What are we looking at there? What that column represents is the called number, the number that's receiving a particular phone call. 
For this specific example, which has the 1-1 before the 10-digit target number ending in 1901, what that represents is a phone call that's routed to voicemail. Okay, and then we have the dialed digits. What is, how is that this different than what we looked at just now? Those are the numbers actually input into the physical handset. In other words, the person who's calling actually inputted those numbers into their handset? Correct. Okay. And then the MR number, wh what does that mean? That's an acronym for mobile role, the role of the target number. Uh, the entries you see underneath there are going to be inbound, outgoing, or routed with respect to the target number ending in 1901. Inbound being that the target number is receiving a phone call. Outbound being that the target number is initiating the phone call. And then routed phone calls. All right, and the start date, what is, what information is provided there? That's the date and time as to when a phone call initially registers onto our network. And when you say it registers onto the network, are we talking about the switch? Or yes. Okay. And then the end date and time, what about that? When a phone call terminates from our network or switch. And the duration, is that, uh, what's the unit of measure there? Seconds. It's the amount of time spent on the network in seconds. And then REPOLL -L -L number, what is that? That's the repoll number. Uh, for the sake of these records, what it is, is a reference to a group of cell phone towers with respect to a certain area. There's a repoll number for Kansas City. There's a repoll number for Dallas. For bigger areas, such as Los Angeles, there's multiple repoll numbers. But again, it references, references some sort of geographic region. And then, the, then it has first cell. What does that mean? That number indicates the specific cell phone tower that the target number is using at the beginning of a phone call. Well, how come we have zeros here? What does that mean? Uh, it can be a couple different things. For text messages, it's not gonna, going to show any cell site information. Also, when phone calls are routed to voicemail, uh, like the first example that we looked at on the screen, that's not going to show any cell site information. When you say it's routed to voicemail, who has the actual system of the voicemail? Is it your company at a server somewhere or is it the phone itself? Sprint, the company Sprint. Uh, we have a server that provides voicemail and the call records will show when an inbound phone call is routed to voicemail accordingly. And then the last cell, what, it, what does that mean? That indicates the specific cell phone tower that the target number is using at the end of the phone call. Okay, I'm gonna go down here and take a look at this entry. And it's uh, June 4th, 2008 at 1148 and 28 seconds. You see that one? Yes. In terms of the time, this time that we have here, does somebody walk around and set the clock for you or is that set according to some other unit of measure of time? In other words, where do you get that? Sure, the timestamp for phone calls is with respect to the switch that's fielding the phone call. So if I make or receive a phone call in the Phoenix area, it's going to represent Arizona time. Okay, and in this case right here, for this line here, the calling number is what? 831-402-1901. And so does that mean that the target number is the one that's making this call? Yes. And then the number that is being called is what? 951-536-2162. And then if we take a look at uh, exhibit number Three sixty-two. Do you see the number there, the mobile directory number? Yes. Are they the same numbers as the one you just read to me? That is the same same ten-digit phone number I just read. Yes. So, 
So our target is calling this particular number, correct? Correct. And then it's listed twice. Um, explain to me why that's listed twice. I know that in the previous example there was a one. Uh, in this one there isn't. So if you don't mind explaining to me what is going on there. Sure. Uh, this is an easier example to explain. The 10-digit phone number ending in 2162 was entered into the handset and was a number that was called. So it was the number that appears in the dialed digits column and the number that appears in the called number column. And this one doesn't have uh, like one ones in front of it. What does that mean? It means it had um, the one ones represent when an inbound phone call is forwarded to the target number's voicemail. So since it doesn't have the one ones, it has nothing to do with voicemail for right. the target number. And it's not an inbound call either, it's an outgoing call, correct? Correct. And if we look at the next column, that's exactly what it tells us, right? Yes. And the date and time of that is what? June 4th, 2008, uh, 2348 military time, 1148 standard time. And the call ended at what time? 2351 military time, 1151 standard time. And how many seconds was that? 169 seconds. So if we look right under it, it says 168. Is that the same call or is that another call? That is the same phone call. H how do you know that's the same phone call? If you look at the times, they overlap. Uh, you see the outgoing aspect of the phone call starting at 2348 and 28 seconds and ending at 2351 and 17 seconds. The second aspect of the phone call begins at the same time and ends just a second earlier. Uh, because of the overlapping times, that is the same phone call. And uh, directly underneath, we have another entry about the same time, but about five minutes apart. Is that a different phone call? That is a different phone call, yes. And that call lasted how many seconds? 961 seconds. And then we can go back and trace it back, and it shows us the same sort of entry that we had before, correct? Yes. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Cross examination. I have none. Any questions from the jury for this witness? I see no hands. Thank you. You may step down. The state may call its next witness. The state calls Leslie Beauty. Spell your last name, please. U D Y. Raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. Thank you. Your name, please. Leslie Udy. And uh, what state do you live in? Utah. Do you know somebody by the name of Jody Arias? Yes. Is she in court today? Yes. Where is she seated and what is she wearing? On the far side, it looks like green. Your Honor, may the record reflect the identification of the defendant? Yes. How did you meet Ms. Arias? The first time I met her was at a prepaid legal convention in Las Vegas. And what month and year, if you remember? Would have been September. I believe 2006. And after that, did you become friends or acquaintances with her? Yeah, we had a few things in common. We both 
um, did photography and things. So yeah, we talked. And did there come a time where you actually took a trip with the defendant and Travis Alexander? Um, yeah, it was a all expense paid trip by our company in Huntington Beach and we were all there. So yeah, we, we spent the time together there. And when was that? That would have been in June of 2007. And during that time, did you and the defendant have any conversations involving the defendant and whether or not she became concerned or involved about Mr. Alexander's use of his telephone? She mentioned that um, she was concerned that he might be seeing someone else, um, some other girls, and I asked why she would think that. And she said that she had seen some texts on his phone. Did she tell you how, what the occasion was or how it was that she was able to see these text messages on his telephone? She said that she had looked at him while he was, I don't know if he was in the shower or asleep, but she had, his phone was there and she, she looked at his phone. Subsequent to that, did you have occasion to see her on June 5 of 2008, which was a Thursday? Yes. And what time of the day did, did you see her? It was in the evening, probably around 7.30ish. Was it after some sort of event? It was actually at the event when I first saw her. And what event was that? It was a prepaid legal um, business briefing. And what time was that event over? It gets over about 8.30, between 8.30 and 9 o'clock we usually leave. And at 8.30, 8, 8.30, um, where did you go? Um, I actually rode with uh, Jody over to Chili's where we were all going to have something to eat. And whose car did you ride in? Jody's. And where did you sit in that car? In the passenger seat. The front passenger seat? Uh-huh. Is that yes? I can't take yes. it. Yes. And um, did you notice whether or not that car had any car mats in it? I didn't. It was dark and I didn't, I didn't notice. In your seat before you sat in it, did you notice whether or not your seat had any stains on it? No. Did you even look for stains or anything? No. So you and the defendant rode over to this restaurant and um, did you just get up and go in or did you have a conversation? And we actually sat out in the parking lot for a while and talked. And how long did you talk? It was probably close to an hour. And during that time, were you able to observe the defendant's demeanor, how she was acting? Yeah. And how was she acting? She was acting like Jody, um, same Jody I always talked to and knew. And during that time, did you and she have a conversation? Yes. What was? Tell me what she said and what you said. Um, um, well, we talked a little bit about photography because she had some pictures she was supposed to send me from Huntington Beach and I hadn't gotten them yet. Um, we talked about um, Travis. And, uh, and what did she say about Travis? She said that they weren't together anymore, which I kind of already knew. I already knew that. And that, um, but that they would always be friends and that they had had a, uh, joked and laughed about the fact that at some point further on um, they would see each other at the prepaid legal events and their children would play together and be friends. And When you say that their children would play together and be friends, Miss Adias and Mr. Alexander's children or it separate and apart? Separately. Okay, so that she would have children yeah. and Mr. Alexander would have children and their children would play yeah. together? What else did she say? Um, she said that uh, Travis had tried to get her to come to Arizona and that she had told him no because she was trying to create some separation there. Um, that that's why she had moved to California is because they'd broken up and she wanted to create that separation. Anything else, anything else about Ms. Mr. Alexander? Not that I can recall. Did she ever indicate whether or not they were good friends, really good friends, or just friends, or did she ever indicate anything like that? She indicated that they would always be best friends. Um, I do remember her saying that, that they, that although they had 
broken up and weren't together anymore, that they would be best friends. And after this conversation, did uh, you guys go into Chili's? Yes. And um, where did the defendant sit? She sat on my right-hand side. And did you see who she sat next to? My husband, Mark. And uh, during that conversation, did your husband raise the issue of any injuries the defendant may have on her hands? Overruled, you may answer yes or no. Yes. And with regard to that question that he may have posed, did the defendant give an answer? Yes. What did she say? She said that she had broken a glass at work and cut her fingers. Now, subsequent to that and after Mr. Alexander's body was found, did you have occasion to receive a telephone call from the defendant? Yes. And about what time was it that you received the call? It was right after she found out that he had been killed. And so was it the wee early morning hours? It was in the, not wee early mornings, but it was in the morning. And by the morning, would it be like 11, 10, or is it? It was probably sometime between 9 and 11, somewhere in there. And at that point, what was her demeanor? What was she? She was very upset and distraught. She was crying, sobbing. And what was she saying? She said that um, Travis was dead, that he'd been killed, and that um, she couldn't imagine why someone would do that to Travis, and how could they do something like that to Travis, that he was such a wonderful person, and why would anybody do that to him? After that phone call, did you receive any telephone calls from her in the wee early morning hours? Yes. How much time between the time that you received the, this last call where she talks about his death and the next telephone call? It was at about 2 o'clock the next morning. And um, how do you know it was about 2 o'clock in the morning? How do you know that? Well, I had told her in the previous conversation that if she needed somebody to talk to, that I would keep my phone by my bed. And so when it was my cell phone, when it went off, my husband made the comment of who in the world would be calling at this time of the morning. And uh, I looked at the clock, and it was about 2 o'clock in the morning. And um, what was the defendant's demeanor? She was upset. She was crying. And what was she saying? She was saying that uh, this was about the time of day that she normally would talk to Travis, that they were both night people, and that they would uh, talk about that time, and that she had lost her best friend, and that she didn't know what to do. She, she, so when she usually talked to him, and now she just didn't know what to do. With regard to those three conversations, the one that you had after the meeting, the one where she informs you of the death, and this last one that you just referenced, in any of those three conversations, did she ever tell you that she killed Travis? No. I don't have anything else. Thank you. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Hello, Ms. Hi. You recall we spoke back in, looks like June of 11, up in Utah? I do. Okay. One of the things you told me during that conversation, and you're aware of what Ms. Arias is being accused of doing, right? Yes. Okay. One of the things you told me during that conversation is that those accusations kind of didn't make sense to you based on the Jody that you knew. Do you remember that? I do. Okay. Could you explain to us what you meant by that? It's actually relevant as to why she thinks that it's different from it, but... Approach.
Ms. Yadi, do you remember the question? Would you say it again, please? I will try. One of the things I, I was reminding you of that back in June of 2011, we spoke about, you know, you were aware of the allegations and how that was not in line with the Jody that you knew. And what I was asking you to do is to kind of explain what to us what you mean by that. Well, the, the person that I had known um, was a very quiet, uh, soft-spoken, uh, gentle person. And so that person that I knew, I, I couldn't imagine could have done something that, like that. Okay. You also told us a story, uh, told me a story about a time when, when you spent the night in Mr. Alexander's home. Yes. And he was on the phone with someone. Can you kind of tell us that? Do you, rem do you know the story I'm referring I, to? Yeah, I do. Okay. Could you please share that story with us? Um, Sustained. She's, I'm not asking for a specific point. Can we approach? I believe I was asking you to relay for us a story about uh, a, a, a night you spent in Mr. Alexander's home when you were there for a, or in Arizona for a business meeting. Could you do that for us now? Um, I came to Arizona for business, and uh, Travis was always, you know, saying, come stay with, if you come down here, come stay with me. Um, I was at his home. Uh -huh. Oh. You may continue the story, but don't tell us anything that he said to you. Okay. Um, I was staying at his home, and uh, I woke up uh, about 1 o'clock in the morning, came out to um, go, go down to the kitchen to get a drink of water, and Travis was sitting on a big beanbag chair right there outside of the bedroom doors. Okay. And what was he doing? He was talking on the phone. Okay. And do you know about what time this was? It was about 1 in the morning. Okay. And do you remember who he was talking to? Jokingly, I said, say hi to Jody. Mm -hmm. And he, can I say what he said? <laughs> Did you get the impression based on that that he was talking to Jody? Yes.
You were asked about this trip to uh, Huntington Beach that you were on. Yes. Uh, Jody was there? Yes. And Mr. Alexander was there? Yes. And you were asked about some conversations you had with Ms. Arias. Um, one thing you weren't asked, though, is during those conversations, were you ever get an inkling or advise that Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias were having a sexual relationship? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Judy. Redirect. One of the things that you testified about was that you knew Ms. Arias, right? Yes. And the person that you knew was quiet, right? Yes. Reserved, right? Yes. And you gave us this, your impression of how she was, right? Yes. Well, let me show you some photographs. to be indelicate with you, but you say you know her. I'm going to address the relevance of the event. Approach. May continue. Don't mean to be indelicate. You said you knew her. You see that photograph? Yep. Do you know who that is? It looks like Jody. Did you know anything about that? No. How about exhibit number 164? Who does that look like to you? Looks like Jody. Know anything about that aspect of her life? No. Exhibit number 162. That's her foot. And this is Mr. Alexander. Sustained. With regard to that, ever see any of these pants that she was wearing? I don't recall seeing them, no. You said that you knew her really well and that was she somebody that, did you, when you answered that question, is it your belief that she would have confided in you in certain things? Objection calls for speculation. Overruled. You may answer. Yes or no? Yes. She confided in, in you about the relationship, right? Yes. But she never confided in you that she killed him, did she? No. I don't have anything else. Any questions from the jury? It looks like we do have one. Any other questions? 
Council, please approach. Hey, Jerry has a question for you. How many meetings or conversations did you have with Ms. Arias before Travis' death? I couldn't even tell you. We spoke lots of times. I, I couldn't give you a number. Follow up from the state. No, thank you. Mr. Nermy. You had several conversations uh, with both Ms. Arias and Mr. Alexander, right? Correct. Those photographs he took of Ms. Arias, did you have any idea of that aspect of Travis's life? No. Thank you. You may step down. The state may call its next witness. The uh, state rests. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take a recess. It is going to be longer than we had originally expected. You do not need to return until January 29th. That's Tuesday, January 29th at 10.30 a.m. Between now and then, continue to follow the admonition. I want to especially stress the importance of avoiding any media contact, any media information. There may be information in newspapers, periodicals, on television. You must be very diligent to avoid any contact with any outside information about this case. Before we adjourn, has anyone seen any media information about this case whatsoever? I see no hands. Are there any questions? When you return on the 29th, assemble downstairs in a jury assembly room in meeting room A where you have been meeting. Thank you. You are excused. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Please be seated. Is there a motion? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, we would be asking for uh, dismissal of the charges uh, based on Rule 20 Arizona Rules of Criminal Procedure. Um, the charges actually, I said plural, but actually it's singular one charge. And I think that's important to note because I think later on when I start talking about some of the case law as it relates to felony murder, that uh, that distinction it becomes important. That we have one count of first degree murder charged in alternative fashions, premeditation and uh, felony murder. There are no underlying counts. There are no charges of burglary, no charges of assault anything of that nature, but one count. Now in the history of this case, there was a fair amount of litigation as it relates to uh, the charge of felony murder, the alternative charge. Uh, after, the, after the 
Ms. Arias sought inquiry as to what the lesser included offenses would be. The state protested, but on March 31st, 2010, they took the position that the lesser included offenses in support of the felony murder charge, that they would be using first degree murder or any lesser included offense of first degree murder and or aggravated assault as the underlying felony for the burglary. So the question becomes, I think, as it relates specifically to this alternative charge, and I will rest as it relates to the premeditation charge just by saying they have not provided enough evidence that a reasonable jury could convict Ms. Arias as it relates to premeditation. But as it relates to felony murder, I think, again, as I said earlier, uh, the discussion is much more um, viable and I think will require uh, some research and, excuse me, some reflection by this court because the case law is so, sits on both sides of the fence. And the reasoning becomes circular and I think the specific facts are thus important. Beginning by drawing the court's attention to ARS 131105A2 uh, related to uh, first degree murder as, as a felony murder, it states that it is in the, in the course of and furtherance of the offense or the immediate flight therefrom. Well, I don't think any of the, the facts uh, that have been delivered in court uh, during the state's case in chief have demonstrated any of this. I think we can certainly agree that it was had nothing to do with the immediate flight. We can disregard any discussion of that. It has to do whether or not this was in furtherance of the offense. The problem becomes, uh, as I said, rather circular with law leaning on both sides of that circle, I should say, because what we're saying, and what the state has said in previous pleadings, and I would note that when this issue came up, Judge Duncan said perhaps this was an issue better taken for Rule 20, and I believe, um, so I don't want there to be any arguments that this is raised judicata as it relates to this issue, because the state now has presented their case. They have presented nothing, nothing as it relates to any other line, underlying felony, nothing. The argument would likely be that she remained in the home unlawfully when uh, she attacked Mr. Alexander because there can be no legitimate dispute about the fact that she was there willingly. We know this because of the photographs the state just showed. We have photographs that show that Ms. Arias was certainly an invited and willing guest in Mr. Alexander's home at 12 45 in the afternoon, or approximately around that time. We have photographs indicating that Mr. Ms. Arias was a welcome guest in the home until after five that afternoon. We know that something changed at that point in time that is depicted on those cameras. So the question becomes, as it relates to felony murder, were these actions taken to facilitate some other crime? No. It's pretty clear. Either, this, the, based on the facts that the state has presented in the course of their case in chief, this is either a case of premeditated murder or it's not. That's really it. Because these are the same events. What would, what would she be furthering? What other crime would she be furthering when she supposedly, by the state's theory, depending on what you believe, shot first, then stabbed, or stabbed, shot first, who knows if there'll be another version of events. But that does not include another underlying felony. I think there's a couple cases uh, that are important for the, the court to uh, take note of in consideration of this motion. Um, State v. Miles, 186, Arizona 10. State v. Martinez, 
218, Arizona 421, and State v. Lacey 187, Arizona 340. The Arizona Supreme Court uh, also released uh, on August 16th, and forgive me, I'm not able to give the uh, standard site uh, my research this morning, State v. Hardy, uh, CR 09-0224, that was uh, decided or announced by the Arizona Supreme Court on August 16, 2002. And I will also cite the court because it is more than likely going to be asserted by the state, um, that case being State v. Moore 222, Arizona 1, that is a 2009 opinion. And what you will see is, when the court reviews these cases, I think what the court will see is that there are cases on both sides related to the facilitation, the furtherance, whether or not, uh, you know, there's cases that talks about burning a building with, with or without the intent to kill the person that's still dead, that there doesn't need to be a distinct felony. But these are different. If we look at Hardy and we look at Moore, they are different cases in the fact that they entered the home. Mr. Hardy entered the home with the victim of the kidnapping in order to facilitate a crime. The argument in Hardy on appeal was whether or not uh, that it was really meant to facilitate, the murders really facilitated, uh, or the kidnapping facilitated the, the murders, uh, and because it was separate individuals and for other reasons because he entered the home, uh, that argument was held not to be correct. And I think Moore is a similar case. But here we have a situation of an invited guest, there for a long time, and at a moment in time, about a minute, something changes. So the essence of the argument, Your Honor, is that there was nothing facilitated at all. There was no distinct offense for this burglary, and the charge, the assertions of felony murder based on that should not stand. Mr. Martinez. The uh, charge of uh, first degree murder, as indicated, uh, can be or was charged in the alternative premeditation and felony murder. As to the premeditation, I don't want to gloss over that. Um, this case shows that on May 28th of 2008, approximately a week before June 4th, the defendant staged a burglary of her own home to steal the murder weapon so that she could kill Mr. Alexander. Um, she then went to rent a car, not in the place that she lived, not the town that she lived, for fear of being recognized. Instead, she went to another town, 90 miles away, Redding, California. She shows up as a blonde and a male with her. When asked by the person who is renting the car to her, where are you going? She says, ah, just around town. And as to the car, well, didn't want a red one because that was a little bit too loud. Didn't want to be noticed. The plan was already in effect and she did not want anybody to know that she was the person that had rented that car. She finds her way down to Mesa, Arizona where Mr. Alexander lives and as part of this plan, this premeditation, she takes, or she took, the license plates, the front and the back license plates off her car. She comes up with a story about some kids at Starbucks, perhaps playing a joke or a prank on her, but that clearly is not true. And so she didn't want to be recognized when she went over to Mr. Alexander's home because she was going to kill him. In addition to bringing the gun, she also brought a knife. And uh, when she got there, she engaged in whatever conduct she engaged in. And then she began to attack him. She began to attack him after she had, in a manner of speaking, lulled him to sleep, had him in a very vulnerable position sitting in that shower. And it is the state's position that she stabbed him first. And it's based on what the medical examiner uh, told us, Kevin Horn, as to what would happen if the shot would have been first? We would not have had that crime scene. 
And so once she, she begins stabbing him, it's not a situation where she stopped. She killed him three times over. And that also can be factored in to the premeditation aspect. The premeditation here can be as long as a week or in between the stabbings and the shootings, we're talking uh, over a minute, maybe two minutes. And as the, the court is well aware of the law, and I will um, regurgitate it and bore everybody about what the law is, that it can be done in a very <coughs> quick fashion. And so this defendant kills Mr. Alexander three different ways. Uh, and so there is, at least for purposes of Rule 20, which is what we're talking about, uh, evidence sufficiently substantial to warrant that uh, aspect of the charge. As to the alternative form of the first degree murder, uh, the felony murder, it is the state's contention that we listed three that apply uh, crimes, but the assault is the one that's most suited. Uh, when she began stabbing him, no one can debate the fact that Mr. Alexander, if he were alive, to be asked, did you really want her to be in your house when she began stabbing you? I am sure he would have said, no, I do not. I don't want her to stab me anymore. And at that point, she is no longer a guest. She's not an invited guest. Her status has changed from that of an invited guest to a murderer. And if that is the case, the assault, the stabbing that continued after that, um, forms the predicate, if you will, for this felony. Uh, the issue has been briefed. You have all of that before you, so I incorporate the reference in my argument and ask you to deny the defendant's request for a Rule 20 uh, judgment of acquittal. Thank you. Just if I may respond briefly. You may. Uh, as an initial matter, before I forget, I would like to certainly reserve the right to re-urge the Rule 20 motion given self-defense law in Arizona and the state's uh, assertions, at least at this point, that a rebuttal case will be made uh, related to the, the burden of proof that the state must have of overcoming Ms. Arias' claim of self-defense. But here I think, in terms of what the state just told you, I think if we read between the lines, we can see the reality that I said that this is either a case of first degree murder or not. This burglary charge is, as has been put in the pleadings related to felony murder is just an empty vessel uh, in order to seek a first degree murder conviction. Um, ultimately, and the state postulated this idea that Ms. Arias came to Ms. Ale Mr. Alexander's home based on this gun theft that occurred at a grandparent's house, came to the home, and that's what we just heard the state say, with a gun and a knife. I would certainly point out to the fact that there's been no evidence that Ms. Arias brought a knife. Uh, the state has not presented any evidence of that, um, nor have they presented a gun. They've only made a link between a theft, um, the theft that occurred a week later. But then it would be seem to be the case, that, again, that she, under the state's theory of what just told you, that she came to Miss Alexander's home with that intent. What the state also said is that she lured him into a vulnerable position by having sex with him. So that was the, the intent would have been formed before she went in the house under what the theory the state just told you. And then what they're saying is that she assaulted, I guess now they're not talking about the lesser included other than assault, that she assaulted Mr. Alexander with the intent to facilitate a murder. And I would say again, the circular reasoning of that is readily apparent. And when we look, when you look at the case law I cited, I think you will see that it is distinguishable from Moore, distinguishable for Hardy, and that the alternative theory of felony murder uh, should not stand. All right, the motion is under advisement. So, the evidentiary hearing, 10.30 a.m. on January 28th. See you then. <laughs>